Big thanks to uh, Carmen for being with us here today. Uh, we'll do a proper introduction, but uh, you know, you know how it is. Just gotta fill up some dead airspace with some, some conversation, throw in a few things. All right, we are live. So welcome everyone, welcome. It is uh, April the 9th. Uh, I wanna thank everyone for joining us for Lunch Bites today. Uh, my name is Dan Blondo. I am the program director for the Hope Learning Center, which is located here in Regina, Saskatchewan, uh, homeland of the Métis, uh, traditional territories of the Soto, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and uh, the Cree. And uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining us today for today's Hello. lunch. Oh, hi there. Uh, we'll just get everyone to mute themselves just off the bat here, just while we do our introductions. And uh, so today we're going to be talking uh, a little bit about uh, autism. Uh, it is uh, World Autism Day. Uh, is that the, the correct? Uh, the, yeah, we're, we're in Autism Awareness Month and today uh, just happens to be World Autism Day. Uh, so we're joined uh, by Carmen Letting, uh, as most of you probably know. She's one of the Hope Learning Center's uh, facilitators here. Uh, she's also the director over at uh, CMHA Rosetown, uh, so we're always uh, grateful uh, for her to pop on here and uh, give kind of her perspective on the topic. Uh, Carmen, you've got, uh, th this is one of those topics that's uh, close to the heart, I imagine. It's uh, something that you've probably got some experience with, so we thought you'd be a great person to kind of come on today and just kind of give us uh, a little bit of an intro to kind of what autism looks like, some of the signs and the symptoms, um, and just some basic ideas of kind of how to empower people uh, either that are neurodivergent uh, or for the rest of us, if we're, uh, I believe it's neurotypical is the other side of that, uh, kind of how to just engage and have more productive conversations and just be, uh, I guess, better champions for anyone out there with the diagnosis. So uh, Carmen, by uh, by that, let's uh, let's go. Do you want me to start uh, with the slideshow, or do you want to just uh, no, no? Of... I'll just let you know when when we're ready to go for some of the stuff. Right. So and, thank uh... you again, Dan. Uh, again, everyone, I hope you know who I am. My name is Carmen Letting. You may know me as a facilitator here on Hope Learning Center, um, but I also am a parent of two children with autism. So I also have the lived experience of supporting someone who lives with autism and the ups and downs of going through the diagnosis process, as well as seeking out some of the supports that um, may be useful for, for people who live with autism again. Um, so uh, not surprisingly, I have um, also a support group here in Rosetown for parents. And I would say 90% of the people there also support people living with autism. So what is it we're talking about today? So as Dan mentioned, it's Autism Awareness Month. And Autism Spectrum Disorder is it's a developmental disorder with symptoms that appear in the first three years of life. And people who live with autism may act or interact in ways that feel different from behavior of other children. And they may respond in unexpected ways or they may not interact at all. However, there once you've met one person with autism, you've only met one person with autism. They do not all act or look the same. So it's important for us as society members to be aware because there may be people who live in our communities who have invisible disabilities and they may act differently from the other people around you. So it's important for us to walk forward with empathy and compassion and learn more about autism. So again, it is a spectrum disorder and it does have a range of forms as well as levels of severity, right? So um, it's important to note that the DSM-5, it ranges in three different levels in terms of severity. So um, that means level one are people who have low need of support, but they still struggle with certain things to a level three. And those are people who may be highly restricted in terms of their verbal uh, communication skills. 
So it's it's really important to know that for people who live with autism, the label high functioning versus low functioning is actually a misnomer and can be really insulting because to everyone else, they may not look like they are struggling, but it is a big struggle for them, even if they are highly verbal and highly productive members of society. So what are the things that people with autism may struggle with? Well, for instance, they may have delayed speech or difficulty in communicating. They may have poor eye contact. There may, they may display as a young child little or no imaginative play. And they also may not have joint attention. So people often mention eye contact. And sometimes that might look like uh, being in a classroom or in a public setting and their eyes are not fixed on the same thing that everyone else is looking at. They may also show limited interest in other people. However, they may have a huge focus on a certain number of interests. And they may also have highly emotional responses to changes in their routine. So children with autism may have a meltdown or a tantrum in public when there was something unexpected for them in their routine. So shifting or transitioning from one place to another unexpectedly to other people may not be a big deal, but to children living with autism, this might be a huge amount of stress in their life. And there might be other outputs that you might not think about. So I often talk about sensory overload for people living with autism. So things like the tags on the back of your shirt, uncomfortable or restrictive clothing, Having someone touch you unexpectedly behind you in line, this to someone with autism may result in sensory overload. And so they may react emotionally or they may need to stim, which is a way to deal with that excess sensory input um, or else emotional regulation. That might look like flapping your hands if you're joyful. It may be... Um, interesting verbal or vocal sound effects. So for instance, my oldest, when we were in Disneyland, massive sensory overload um, was making interesting sound effects. And someone said, you could be in movies, you could be the sound effects person because you're making some of these interesting sounds. Again, that was my son's way of processing that sensory overload at the time, right? So if you see someone in public doing these things, remember, this is a way for them to stem, stim. And someone who described stimming said, it's like scratching an itch, except it's across your brain and your body. And it causes deep physical pain to not be able to express that physical stimming back activity. So again, for some people, they may need to stim in order to remove sensory discomfort or to express joy, right? So it's important for us to remember that people stimming in public isn't something that should be hampered or should be punished. It is again, the way they process their world. And one thing you might not know about autism is that uh, it is a neurotype. It's a different way that your brain is shaped and it has far more synapses in certain areas that people in the average population may not have. In fact, it has been said that a person with autism processes up to 42% more information, even at rest. So even when they're sleeping versus the average population. However, the problem with this is that it can be difficult to filter or to categorize some of that information. And then as you can understand, it results in overload, sensory overload, emotional exhaustion and dysregulation and burnout. 
Another thing that most people may not know about autism is that much of classical autism symptoms have been diagnosed based on males. And so it is often said that is more found in boys than in girls, when in fact, girls are often more predisposed to quote unquote masking in public. This means they might be more hyper aware of how to emulate behaviors that mimic other people, right? And so they might fall under the radar a little bit more than boys. And the only problem with that is that many girls experience a lot of burnout and are very vulnerable to um, difficult relationships because they're trying to figure out how to fit in when in fact it's important that they stand out and be themselves. So in terms of my journey as a parent of children with autism, I had one child who was diagnosed at the age of nine and um, was struggling in school, not at an intellectual ability level, it had to do with transitions. It had to do with loud announcements in, in the classroom. And sometimes it became very evident in rigid behaviors. So in terms of, for instance, my child calling out other children when they were breaking the rules, but in fact, not being able to recognize when he was breaking the rules, right? Um, my other child, who was diagnosed as an adult, um, was uh, very different from my other child in that they, um, they masked heavily, but were seen as struggling with anxiety and depression. Um, and in fact, it was found that they had um, autism as the primary reason for a lot of their stress. So things that might be important for us to know is what is useful for people who live with autism. First and foremost, I would highly advocate that if you think your child is struggling and may be possibly living with autism, it's important to seek out diagnosis from a knowledgeable professional. In my case as a parent, both of my children received private diagnoses from professional doctoral psychologists, but that is not something that is necessarily accessible for all people. Remember that a diagnosis is not a label or a pigeonhole. It's about knowing yourself and why you are struggling with your current living atmosphere, right? It's a way to advocate and empower yourself to find out what you need in terms of accommodations. And because many people with autism may also live with co-occurring diagnoses like ADHD, dyscalculia, dysgraphia, right? Dyspraxia, which has to do with body awareness. Um, they may also live with things like epilepsy, right? And so it's important to, again, remember you are unique and it's important that in order to know how to empower yourself, it's important to know with how you are struggling, what your strengths are, and what are some areas that you need to look to other professionals like occupational therapists, for instance, so that you can find your way to live a productive life. So again, I do mention other professionals because it's important as, for instance, a parent to recognize your own limitations. And I feel it's more empowering to focus on what your child can do and what you can do rather than to focus on being angry or to focus on how things should be. Because for many parents of children who live with autism, going through the diagnosis process can involve a bit of grief. And we've talked about this in understanding grief and loss here at Hope Learning Center. And it's a non-death grief in terms of 
you always pictured how parenting was going to be before you became a parent. And you have a very white picket fence view of how it will go. And sometimes receiving a diagnosis puts a screeching halt to that. But it's important for you to remember your child is so unique and so wonderful. And again, to advocate so that they can learn more about themselves so that they too can advocate for their needs, advocate for the accommodations they require to be productive, both in school and society at large, and to be curious, again, instead of being feeling like they are broken and need to hide. So I like to focus on a few things that are really important, again, to empower people who live with autism. So the first thing I would recommend, um, I think this is on slide one, Dan, that I shared with you. So I really like that children, for instance, with autism, learn that instead of trying to figure out if they're normal versus not normal, I like finding ways for children to see other children who are unique, just like them, and to learn more about their superpowers. And so I've actually found this on Instagram, another um, page that talks about books featuring children with autism and their unique capabilities. For instance, this first book that I've listed, Maya Plays the Part, talks about masking in public, right? And talking about, you know, in, in terms that children can understand what it is like on an everyday experience of masking in public and how she copes. The next series I've mentioned is The Many Mysteries of the Finkel Family. And this features two autistic sisters who launch a detective agency. Again, they talk about their quirks as autistic people and being children, right? It normalizes the autistic experience. Next, we have a trilogy called Bat and the Waiting Game by Elena K. Arnold. And this is a wonderful uh, trilogy exploring the life of an autistic boy through his eyes. And then the final one I've listed is Can You See Me? And this is by Libby Scott and Rebecca Westcott. And this is talking about, again, an autistic girl struggling with masking in public. And I like, instead of giving people resources that are just, you know, medical journals, sometimes for children, this is more accessible to show them people who have some of their interesting quirks um, so that they, they feel less marginalized and they want to learn more about themselves. So that is why I list that. Um, so the next slide I want to share is about empowerment and to remember to focus on what you can do rather than what you can't do. And this is from a researcher who is himself autistic. So Dan, if you could show that one. Oh, the one before that. Okay. So this is Dr. Carrie Magro. And he himself was diagnosed very young with nonverbal autism. And he says here, I'm an autistic adult. I cannot ride a bike and have trouble buttoning my shirts. I'm also a doctoral student. So it disappeared there. See if I can Sorry find about that. That's okay. It's my screen. So we jumped out of the PowerPoint somehow. Okay. Uh, so, just give me a few seconds. I'll get it right back. That's okay. Here. He can pull it up. So he says, I'm an autistic adult. I cannot ride a bike and have trouble buttoning my shirts. I, I'm also a doctoral graduate and have a job as a professional speaker. The ability to button your shirts does not determine your success, right? And so he has a really awesome book as well, talking about being an autistic person, even to the point of talking about some of the restrictive diet things, you know, having safe foods, which again, to the society at large, people don't seem to understand that. And it's really hard to advocate 
for yourself when people are looking at how you don't fit in, right? And sometimes it's important to focus on, again, your strengths rather than viewing yourself as broken, right? Let me uh, just take two seconds. Uh, what do you mean by safe foods? Um, can you so, just expand on that a little bit? So for certain people who live with autism, they may have a very rigid or restricted diet. Again, as I mentioned before, it may be difficult to filter some of that extraneous information. So their palate may in fact be more sensitive than the average person. So hmm. it may be the smell of foods. It may be the texture of foods, right? And so for some children, that may look like only being able to eat um, cold chicken nuggets for lunch mm -hmm. um, and, and introducing new things, new textures, new tastes, new smells may be very overwhelming for them, again, because they have to slowly introduce it into their diet. So again, to the average person, we may not realize this is a major issue for certain people who live with being on the autistic spectrum yeah so uh, thanks for uh, asking that no and that's totally something I'd, I'd never even thought about that the sensory issues that's not just touch feel sight mm -hmm. it'd be your, and, your sense of smell and taste too why and wouldn't? there's no litmus test right yeah. for showing why this person is going for, through this so to the average person seeing someone having a tantrum or a meltdown in public for these reasons the average person may think why are they why are they being disobedient? Mm -hmm. Why are they being so loud? Why are they not obeying their child, their parent? When in fact, the child is sincerely struggling to, you know, for instance, being in a grocery store where there's too many people, too many crowds, too many mm -hmm. people touching them. There's loud um, over music. There's the lights are overwhelming, right? Mm -hmm. And again, it's it's hard for them to communicate their needs if they are overwhelmed sometimes, right? Yeah, thank so, you for going back to that. Appreciate yeah, it. another thing I would like to mention, I'd like to give a shout out to parents of children with autism. I'd like to applaud you for being an advocate and for empowering your child and remember that you are doing your best. I would honestly recommend as someone who's gone through the experience First and foremost, to remember to take time for yourself. You can't take care of a child with uh, complex needs if you don't take care of yourself. And Dan, um, if you have that battery picture, we could show that here too. Dude, um, it's yeah. you have to be very, you have to be very curious. You have to be very passionate and you have to check, you have to pick your battles as a parent with an autistic child. Um, so it's, it is very important to remember that. Second of all, I really have to remember to tell you to delegate. There are certain things that parents can handle beyond that be willing to delegate to the professional that that's their expertise. If you don't know the answer to something, Find a professional who can help you. Remember, you don't have to do it all. Third of all, I'd say to parents, find your tribe. So this means finding the cheerleaders who are your best cheerleaders, whether you are in the room or not. People who support you and will stay silent instead of giving their opinion on how you are. Oh, thank you so much. So I, I, I do love using this and reminding parents of this because sometimes we're more obsessive with making sure our, our phones are charged rather than taking care of ourselves, right? And remember when you are spread too thin, you cannot take care of your child's every need. So remember, don't let your battery get on low, take care of yourself. And again, find your tribe who is willing to accept you and your child as you are, because when you feel you can be yourself, it is so much more relaxing and empowering. Third of all, I would like to put out an appeal to society at large, as well as employers. And this is where, Dan, I'd like to put the THINK acronym up on the last slide of that I've given you today. Remember, if you see a child melting down in public, laying down, you know, kicking and screaming, 
it's not that they are being disobedient. It's not your place to judge before you speak, think, and remember, is it truthful? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Remember, you don't know all of the struggles of the people that you see in public. It's important to keep your judgment to yourself. And if anything, if you're going to talk to a stranger, say, mom or dad, you're doing a great job. Good for you. Cheer them on and keep your judgments to yourself. And finally, I'd like to make sure that everyone knows that people living with autism have a variety of strengths that you might not know about, which includes attention to detail, um, not hovering around the water cooler, making sure that something is done the same thing every time, right? So remember, before discounting people with autism, remember they bring so much variety and empathy and just different color to the world. So remember that they are valuable members of society and we should be looking for different ways to include them. So thank you everyone. And uh, yeah, I would just like to open it up, uh, Dan, to any questions or comments. Sure. It looks like, uh, David, we've got uh, your hand up there. If you want to unmute yourself, feel free to uh, turn it yeah. on. Hi, um, my name is Javen. Um, okay. You know, I took about uh, 21 mental health courses here with Sassel Learning Center. And, you know, this is my first lunch bite. So Carmen actually invited me in my peer support meeting. And honestly, I'd say you did really well. Um, for me, the um, reason why... I'm saying I'm most I live with high functioning autism. So um I was diagnosed quick story, I was diagnosed when, you know, um I was five, but you know, it wasn't easy for me. I didn't really have supportive parents. They, you know, kinda gave up on me. And that's one thing I really wanna pressure you or not well encourage you, sorry. Um to basically, um, you know, don't give up on your child like my parents have, you know. Honestly, I know it wasn't easy for my parents, but, you know, um, like, honestly, if so, like, every life, even like, you know, if the, every life is precious, every life gives meaning to life in one way or another. That's why they're here. And, you know, for me, if you want to know what, what I'm going to tell you, how I struggle with autism, you know, communication, sometimes what I say doesn't come out. Um, you know, I go for my emotions differently. So if someone hurts me, I might process that longer than the average person. And yeah, um, when I was younger, you know, I struggled with switching from course to course when I was younger. And I also struggled with anger management before, too, and mm -hmm. depression. And that's something when I was like, you know, I'm better now. But, you know, you know, um, autism is manageable. You know, if like, you know, if you're having a hard time, I know people with autism are really hard to communicate at times. But, you know, there is hope and there is hope if you need Thank help. Thank you for that, Jamie. And, yeah. Thank you very That's much. awesome. Yeah, and yeah. I, I really appreciate you commenting, Jabin. And it's important as well for us to recognize, um, I hope that SASC Hope Learning Center has been a valuable resource for you in learning about yourself and empowering yourself in, in living has, independently. Yeah. 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 Honestly, how I got the how I got to know SAS Hope Learning Center was basically well, I was trying to, I was struggling with anger management and you know, we were trying to find a course on, I was like, I was with Becky um, McLeod, who's like my independent living teacher before at the Autism Research Center in, in Regina. And the whole reason how I know you guys is because of the Autism Research Center and because um, we found we found out your stuff online, and it's because of them I got to take these courses and how I know about awesome. them. Well, thank you so much, Jabin, for being uh, a cheerleader for us. We really appreciate it. Dan, yeah, are there okay. any other questions? 
Uh, I don't uh, see any in the chat, but if anyone does have anything they'd like to ask, now's the perfect time. We still got a couple minutes before we'll wrap it up for the day. Uh, you can either type that into chat, or if you just want to unmute yourself, feel free to uh, just ask through the mic. Uh, otherwise, um, Carmen, is there, uh, I mean, we just heard the uh, Autism Resource Center here in Regina, but uh, are there any other resources that uh, you yourself have found uh, that you've kind of turned to uh, through through the years that might be a, another recommendation or anything like that? There, there are like, so definitely fine agencies. So there's definitely the Autism Resource Center in Regina, there's Autism Services in Saskatoon, Mm. Um, and then actually a site that I would recommend is autism.org. And mm. they also have um, different videos and other things that you can access. And it's really just important for you to find places that or resources that are, you know, vetted, important. Yeah. Um, and that one, autism.org was was given to me by uh, uh, an autism consultant in my region. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, it's just really important for, for everyone to just keep looking. There are people who are out there to, um, to assist. Perfect. Um, well, I, I do have kind of one uh, question. So, uh, Carmen, you had mentioned that um, both of your children had gotten diagnoses, but at uh, mm -hmm. quite different points in yes. their life. And I'm just curious, um, obviously, uh, someone that's much younger uh, is probably going to be diagnosed a little bit differently than someone that's older. And I'm just kind of curious about what that looked like uh, between the two of them while that was kind of well, happening. Both of them are, are are very different from one another. One is more social, but struggles more with transitions. Right. Um, and uh, verbal comprehension, we found out even later on that he was really, really struggling with that. So as Jabin described, sometimes if someone takes a while to respond to you, it's important to wait instead of thinking that they are being rude or or ignorant, remember that people process verbal information at different speeds. Mm -hmm. And so as a mom who likes to multitask, I was peppering with lists, you know, get into the car, do this, do this, da, 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 da. And for him, he was struggling with remembering the first two words that I said, and I didn't know that. Okay. Um, my other child, however, is less social um, and struggled more with internalizing certain um, certain things. Um, but was masking highly, again, very highly intelligent, but to teachers and everyone else, because they weren't showing some of these other um, behavioral cues um, in terms of speaking out, making funny noises, they kind of fell under the radar, right? But then when we saw certain other executive functioning things like doing chores um, or um, something that, you know, other people wouldn't find a big deal was a yeah. big deal to her. So yeah, it's every, again, it's just important to remember every person with autism is different. They right. do not all have the same issues. And so that's where having the screening, the diagnosis can be so valuable because it can break down, you know, the different learning aptitudes that they have. Right. And other things that you may not know, because it's, again, an invisible disability for many people. It, you can't lump everyone into the same category or, or aptitude. Sure. Um, and just one last one from, from myself. Mm -hmm. Here, uh, I, I am just curious if we could expand just a little bit more on just the concept of masking. Like, uh, if, if we just chat for just a brief second about kind of what what that is. Just, I, I'm sure most probably already understand the idea, but just if you could kind right. of give us a little bit more of an idea of kind of what that. So exactly masking means. can it may not look like anything to the outside person, but right. masking for a person living with autism may be trying to hide your gut reaction to certain things, right. um, hiding or be go being really silent, for instance, and not um, being argumentative if your boundaries are being infringed upon, mm -hmm. not being willing to ask questions if you have that burning urge to have a question answered and you can't think of anything else. 
But again, because it's being internalized, it causes a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression and other things. It may also mean trying to sit on your hands if you want to flap them all the time because you need to stim, right? So again, masking mm. means for a lot of people trying to look like everyone else, but it means shutting down um, other communication centers in your brain and repressing different urges that make it very physically and emotionally exhausting for you. So it's really just the person's attempt to kind of, they may be self-aware enough to know that what their mm -hmm. sense of normal is seems off from everybody else. And, right. and they're just trying to, I guess, fly under the radar in some sense. In some sense, and people. to some extent, almost trying to speak in a language that doesn't make any sense to you because you are right. trying to mimic what looks normal or neurotypical to everyone else. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the clarification there. That's mm -hmm. great. Um, well, we're just about at one o'clock here. Uh, Carmen, unless there's anything else you'd like to add into today's conversation, we can probably uh, wrap it up here. Uh, the only other thing is I'm going to include in, in the chat my email because Sometimes there's a lot of questions that people have that they feel more comfortable asking one-on-one -on -one rather than, you know, verbally in front of a group. And sure. so uh, I, I just honestly, I, I really want to reiterate that everyone is doing their best and to parents and to people who are living with autism to applaud you for taking care of yourself and to be curious and learn more about yourself, be more self-aware. The more you are, the more you're able to advocate for yourself and empower yourself. We've got one comment here, Carmen. So glad you can be so clear and reassuring. And absolutely, this is wonderful. Uh, the only other thing I just uh, forgot, we had uh, in the show notes for today, uh, we have the uh, registered disability uh, savings plan. Mm -hmm. uh, we had done a, a lunch fight episode on it quite a while yes. back. Uh, I think in 2023, we re-aired it. Yes. Um, so if anyone is curious, uh, that that is a... Uh, and I really wanted to make sure that people are aware of it because not everyone is aware who is eligible for RDSPs. And if you or someone you know is living with autism, the RDSP is such a valuable resource so that you can access more funding for the supports that you need. Yeah. So if anyone's curious, that is just linked uh, down in the uh, show description. Uh, that'll be on Facebook, Instagram, wherever we've got this all posted, uh, YouTube. Uh, just scroll down it'll be highlighted right there we've got the link to the episode so you will have to probably just go through uh, some of the episode but we had a guest speaker on uh, who was uh, very uh, knowledgeable about what that rdsp looked like and how to apply for it and who qualified and everything so it's a really good episode to touch on if that's something that uh, anyone out there is curious about um, so Carmen, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on today. I know you are, uh, the, one of the busiest, uh, folk I, I know, uh, in CMHA these days. So I just, I, I really appreciate you coming on and, uh, taking a, a little bit of time to kind of help, uh, just explain autism and hopefully we've, we've empowered, we've knowledge, we've, we've delivered some knowledge and, uh, yeah, just really appreciate you being here today with us. And Javen, thank you for sharing today as well. And uh, for everyone else. No problem. It's been uh, great. We will be back uh, next week and uh, we'll catch everybody then. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Thank you.